Man, <laughs> what a blessing to hear from the youth, huh? <laughs> I mean, yeah, give it up. Give it up. You know, um, my wife and I, we've been going up that mountain uh, to youth camp for over five years, and it never ceases to amaze me every time I see them come up here and testify to their experiences about abundant joy, more peace, more hope, more love, more freedom as they share. Having a true encounter with the living God, having that mountaintop experience. And it's funny to see their faces up here and, and just seeing their smiles and, and they're full of joy. I kind of liken it to Peter, you know, at, at Jesus' transfiguration when he saw the radiant Jesus white as light, and even saw Moses and Elijah showing up to have a conversation with Jesus. Peter was in such awe, he was in such awe that even before the Father in heaven came to again declare that Jesus was his son, he said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Yeah. No, no duh, right? I mean, that's funny that Peter says that. Lord, I like it here. It's good to have an, a mountaintop experience. It's so great to have a mountaintop experience. How many of you guys, raise your hands, have had that moment? You know, the mountaintop experience where you feel like you've encountered God in a special way and experienced his love, peace, or joy, or, or hope. No one? Oh, okay, there's a few of you. Of course, me too. As a Christian, I would hope that at some point you had an experience that brought you in and not just a... a, a an in, in intellectual connection, but, but, but starting with an experience of the heart. That's why what's, what happens after that experience that uh, Jesus had after the transfiguration for the disciples was a little frustrating for me. You know, after that, ex, uh, that experience up there, they head back down the mountain. And what was recorded to happen to the disciples when they came down? Well, they struggled and could not heal a demon-possessed boy. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. You're talking about the same disciples who had just experienced the, you know, the radiant Jesus, the one whose f uh, face uh, shone as bright as the sun, uh, who witnessed a visit from a couple of the cornerstone prophets of, the, of God's redemptive plan, not to mention a little cameo from the heavenly father himself, and they struggled right after that mountaintop experience, and then they struggled. And my guess is that just like myself and the disciples and possibly even my youth, as I've heard some of their stories from coming down the mountain, we've all, we all eventually have to come down that mountaintop and struggle in some way, somehow. Maybe that experience was 30 years ago. Maybe it was 30 days ago. Maybe you've had multiple mountaintop experiences, but it always seems that you can't break away free from some of the things that just keep you from growing in him the way you have heard or read about. Sort of like how Hope said, you know, we got to keep growing. But there sometimes is this roadblock or an obstacle that gets in the way. Why do we do that? Why do we continue to struggle with those obstacles? Why for some of us, it seems like we can never even get back to that place. Like we're getting stuck in a rut. So frustrating. Sometimes I liken it to my own personal health journey. I mean, as you could see, some of my friends in here uh, that go with me to Zambia, Africa, know that our Zambian friends, when they see me, they see this, and they say, wow, that is a man of prosperity. <laughs> you have a gift of prosperity, my friend. And it must be a generational gift getting handed down because I have many family members who seem to have that same gift. But it's funny because the running joke in Elisa and I's uh, family and walk is that when she's ready to try to drop a couple pounds here and there, she's going to work hard. She's going to, you know, watch what she eats and she's going to do all this and she'll, she'll probably knock out five to ten pounds in, in a, a quarter of the year and she feels pretty good about it. And what she hates about it is that I'll sit there, not do any of those things, maybe cut out some soda and I'll drop 20 in about three weeks. And it's so frustrating for her pretty cool for me, yeah, but, um, 
But you know what's funny is after that first 20 pounds, what ends up happening, and I've, uh, I have one of my buddies, Mark, in here that I go to the gym with, and I always tell him, I go, man, the first 20 is easy. It's the next 20 that's always uh, a trouble for me, and that's what it is. It's like a plateau. Some of you guys might have done that as well. You've lost a few, and you're like, wow, this is, this is so great. And then all of a sudden, it starts to plateau, and you're like, man, I'm really working still. What's going on? And uh, some of you might decide, well, that's the end. I'm just going to stick with this. Or some of you are like, forget it. And some of you will try to find ways of uh, breaking through that plateau with a different type of strategy, right? That's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit today is um, I was studying the book of Titus and felt God was helping me through some of these feelings I had about plateaus in my life, spiritual plateaus specifically. I want to share some of that with you today. And so I entitled this uh, message with you from plateau to overflow, letting God fill you up for breakthrough. So let me give you a little context. If you guys aren't familiar with Titus, it's a small book in the Bible. I like small books because, well, I get really distracted from reading. So it was easier for me. It, Titus is a letter uh, that Apostle Paul wrote to his trusted disciple and co- traveling companion, Titus. Titus was a Greek Christian. Uh, he was sent to the Greek island of Crete uh, to restore order to some of the house churches out there. Now, in ancient culture, the, or in ancient times, the culture in Crete was pretty bad. I mean, it was so bad that they had a word for being a liar, and it was kretizo, which literally translated to be a Cretan. That's how bad it was. Even in modern times, some of the people in this room, not, not, probably not the younger ones, you've heard that in movies or maybe even called people that or maybe people called you that. Oh, you Cretan, you know? It's a word we don't hear as much anymore, but that was kind of what it was referencing, to be a Cretan. And what it meant was that if you were a Cretan, you were, because Crete was filled with greed, violence, and sexual corruption. Eventually, the house churches came under these corrupt leaders in Crete. They said they were Christians, but they were ruining the churches out there and discrediting the message of Christianity uh, with their choices. Now, Paul's letter was to serve instructions to Titus to restore order. Titus was to focus on installing new elders who would provide a true representation of the Christian living, people with integrity and faith to model to the Cretan people a true way of abundant life in God. Paul also wanted Titus to, con- to confront those corrupt leaders, to let them know that you can't be in it for yourself. That t- and that's in the first couple chapters of Titus. And then we get to chapter 3, and that's where Paul shares what a new Christian household will look like and instructs Titus to be prepared for every good work, reminding everyone in those, uh, those elders and, and those churches to be gentle and courteous to those lost Cretans that they might engage then he explains why. So if you have them, open your Bibles to Titus 3, verses 3 through 7. And I want to unpack this passage a little bit with a focus on verses 5 and 6. I really felt that it helped me with my desire for more breakthrough in my life, and I hope that it will do the same for you. And if you want to put that up, you can do so, Levi. And what it says in the Word of God, in verse, starting with verse 3, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of the works done by us in unrighteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by grace, we might be heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I don't need that. I read to you, this was so cool, I saw this at at youth and uh, the youth camp and I just thought how powerful it was and I'm going to do it here I read to you from the greatest story ever told and I bear witness to you this day 
that all of its words are true. Amen? Now, Paul's letter is primarily about being agents of spiritual transformation, helping bring about a new way. But I think chapter 3 can help all of us. It doesn't matter where we are in life. It doesn't matter if we know God or we don't. Let's just break it down a little further. We'll start with verse 3. It says, For ourselves we were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Paul's instructions are sobering because he reminds us that in verse 3, that no matter where we come from, no matter what our background is, whether we're a Hebrew zealot like Paul or a Greek Gentile like Titus, we can all relate to having a life that is less than whole before we met Jesus. Oh no, wait, wait, wait. I'm a little different though. The stuff I'm going through, it's a little more than what you guys are going through and God probably can't help me. I think we all know that that's not true. We know that God has seen it all. And we can relate to each other and God can relate to us. And for me personally, sometimes it seems so long ago that I have hard times remembering that person that I was that connects and relates with that verse. Many of you here know me as Micah, a youth pastor here at Elevation ministering to the motorcycle community with the black sheep that happened to be here and the handsome and fun-loving husband of Alicia. <laughs> Did I mention modest too? Yeah, that's right. But what you probably don't know about me, and you could show them that, pers that, that person that, I, that maybe you know, is it's a blurred picture there, and that's really what it was. My life was blurred back then. But you probably don't know that I was this guy. Verse 3. Foolish, disobedient, led astray, slave to various pleasures, malicious even, hated by others, hating others. To give you some context, between the ages of 18 and 22, I finally felt I was free from the shackles of what I believe was an overbearing divorcee mother who was trying to hold on to the last thing that she could control, which was her youngest son. I saw what divorce did to my mom, how it broke her heart, and it made me angry. So much so that I made an inner vow that when I got married that it'd only be once and it would be good. It would be great. Although I really didn't know it, it became a goal for me to succeed in a marriage and I would work, <laughs> I would work hard at it. I was engaged at 18 years old with my high school sweetheart. But we were so up and down, it failed. It failed bad. And I kept trying to go back, almost as if I was thinking like I can't let it fail. Because I didn't want to see the failure that I saw and how it hurt my mom and her relationship. I didn't want to see that in my own life. And I was angry. It didn't work out though. After I built up a little bit more trust, felt I can get through it, I had another serious relationship. This time, though, I thought, you know what? I'm going to do something else this time. I'm going to live with this person and make sure it's okay. Because if, you know, if it's bad, I can get out, you know? So I'm going to do that. Worked hard. Wasn't making a lot of money, but had to take care of two mouths, you know, trying to make it happen. Well, guess what? Eventually, it didn't work out. And I was angry because it failed too. And what bothered me the most was that failure. It was like a wound that I couldn't deal with. And it creeps into other parts of my life too. But that was the one. That picture that he shared earlier, you know, what's funny is that night, it all came out. That night, I lost control I expressed my heartbreak in a drunken stupor 
until I was wheelchaired out of the establishment. I was angry and I was rationalizing that my failings were, the, were not my own, that I was working hard. But the one that wasn't was the other person in the relationship. It was their fault. And this happened multiple times. So now I'm thinking, man, maybe it's just women in general. <laughs> I hope that wasn't laughs of like, amen, brother. You know, so. <laughs> no, because that's not what I'm getting at. That's not what I'm getting at. Uh, I started to actually, I can tell you, there's probably one person in this room who knows the way I felt at that time, how sometimes I would share what I thought about women at that time in my life. I hated them. I did. I really did. In my woundedness, I even did foolish things. Like one time I pursued a woman that was engaged to be married. I contributed to their engagement being broken up. And when she looked for deeper commitment from me, I avoided her. For the young ones in the room, I ghosted her. You know, and I felt a little remorse. I felt a little remorse, but I, I tried to rationalize my actions as if I was saving her from what would become a troubled marriage anyway. If she's willing and able to do that with me, then what about that? How ridiculous, right? That my mind would be so messed up that I can even try to rationalize it and turn it around like, I'm helping out this poor soul. The saying is true. Hurt people, hurt people. And that's what I was doing. It, get, it got worse. Because after that, I started to get addicted to pornography. I started to see things and, and think like, maybe that is a way, and maybe I got the wrong idea about intimacy, and that is a way to get there. When it got really bad, I started to take ideas from that and start to do malicious things, like manipulating people for my benefit without a care of how it hurt them. It became a regular thing. And now as I read Titus and I look back, I realize I was a cretin. <laughs> what a cretin. I was a cretin. I thought it would fill my emptiness, right? But it didn't. It actually made it worse. And then, I, then it hit. <laughs> I'm in this normal cycle, this normal practice of just being manipulative and, and just chasing the craziest of things because I thought it would fill my emptiness, and it never did, of course. But then one Thanksgiving night, after having dinner with my family, you would think on a night of Thanksgiving with your family that you would feel filled up. I felt the, the opposite. I felt empty. I felt so alone that I left after dinner with the family and I couldn't be alone I needed to get that next fix so I went to the local bar on Thanksgiving night mind you looking for that next thing no one was there just me and the male bartender and it was then I knew for some reason just hit me that I was chasing something that would never fill me up and fill that emptiness. Although I was a Cretan, I started to worry because I was a Cretan, could I even be saved from what I was and who I had become? Then let's look at verse five, four and five and seven. I didn't like who I was, but I take comfort in knowing this part of the letter Paul wrote. It says in verse 4, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. And I skip down to 7. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 
Interestingly enough, as I was feeling that, as I left that day and I knew that there was something else and I wanted something else and I desired something else, slowly but surely, I began to recognize God's presence in my life. And that's funny. I, I use the word recognize because that's very important. I believe God was always pursuing me. And he gave me all sorts of signs and he gave me all sorts of opportunities. But because of this and because of all that torment and because of the layers of ickiness, I couldn't see it. But then I started to. And on Father's Day 2004, I gave over my life to my father. And I allowed him to pour into me a little bit. At first, it didn't seem like much changed, but then he started to mend some of my hangups, and I found he healing in certain places. Eventually, he brought me an answer to prayer, the love of my life, Alicia. And I thought to myself, I remember when I got married, I thought to myself like, wow, how could God forgive me a Cretan for what I was? And it wasn't because of me. It was because God showed me his mercy. That he, that is to say, his mercy is, is to say, he spared me from what I truly deserve. And in that moment, I recognized and I realized I was on a mountaintop. I felt it. I was on a mountaintop experience, and that was great. You see, from that verse, that passage, God doesn't save us because we are bad, but because he is good. His kindness and mercy isn't triggered because of our hate, but because of his love. I was feeling good, guys, mountaintop experience. But as I mentioned before, eventually you come down the mountain. Eventually you do. We had a great start to a marriage. Everything seemed great. Had a home, had ministry, had, you know, uh, our church, friends, we're traveling, a lot of great stuff happening. But the truth is, we put a lot of undue pressure on our marriage through unwise choices that we were making. From the outside, it kind of looked fine to people probably, although some people could see some of the, the junk still. But really, we were going through more of the motions. And I was failing as a husband and a head of the household. I really was. I wasn't being the godly man I needed to be to take care of my wife. We started to plateau. That upward experience that I was feeling started to flatten out a little bit. And it started to be more just programmatic, our lives. Um, and eventually I didn't like that feeling. So I said, God, let me get, take the steering wheel for a minute here because I can work hard and try to fix some of the things we were getting into or how we were how we were living life but in 2011 we hit a tipping point and some of those very wounds that I thought were healed the wounds of the fear of failure came surfacing up again and something triggered me and I guarantee you I brought about a rage in me like never before even when before I knew God. I mean, I've been saved. What's going on? What are you talking about? That can't be possible. Uh, but it was. Now, I changed. I wasn't doing some of the things I did when I was, you know, before I knew the Lord. But now I did different tactics. I stonewalled. If you don't know what that means, that means shut it down. Didn't even pay attention, you know? I just avoided life, friends, people I didn't want to connect with anymore. I was angry at God for what I believed was to be a pending failure. It was on its way, right? I had blown it again. I'll tell you what, I did not like that feeling. And what started to return was this emptiness. And for about four months, while I was wallowing and stonewalling and avoiding 
my life and my wife, she was there praying for our marriage, praying that something would be restored. And yet, here I was, just not allowing any of that to creep in. But I didn't like the emptiness either. And about four months later, after I wrestled with all that, I could tell God was giving me this opportunity, like, hey, surrender it to me. Surrender it. We'll be good. And uh, I did. I felt it. I said, okay, Lord, I'm ready to surrender it here. All of it this time. You take the wheel back because I'm just driving it off a cliff. And in return, he poured out richly his spirit on me, and I began to see new levels of freedom peace and joy to the point even where some of those fears I had before I don't have the same way anymore it's because of him see try as we may our efforts alone will never measure up I tried I tried believe me but through his love for us he justifies us that is to say he declares us righteous in his sight not because of what we've done, but because of what he has done. Because obviously, if it was about what we had done, we're screwed. No, he justifies us through his grace. That is to say, that he gives us more than we could ever deserve. So where his mercy was, he spared us from the things we truly deserved. <laughs> Graces he lavishes upon us to the point of wastefulness almost. The things that we shouldn't deserve, he gives them to us because of his love for us. And he did it through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He gives us more than we can ever deserve. We have, that's right, guys, we have an access to an abundant and eternal life, not because of what we've done, but because of what he did through Jesus Christ on the cross and through the conquering of death. So how do we get there? When we get to the plateau, how do we get to the point of where he can fill us up? With all the junk that we bring to the table, how do we begin to experience that abundant life that we hear so much about? And I want to take a closer look at verses 5 and 6. It says, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The washing of regeneration. Here it's a Greek word. It's a, it's a Greek word. Uh, it's palingenesis. And basically what it's saying is new birth, right? He will wash us over with new life in that new life he will renew our heart to align with his and because of Jesus God sends us an advocate the Holy Spirit who he will pour out richly on us so there are a lot of funny words but let me put it this way imagine that you were headed towards death. You knew you were feeling it. You were starting to break down. And you had a failing ticker. It wasn't working anymore. And you went to the doctor. And the doctor told you, no problem. Here's what we're going to do. Forget about all those years of wear and tear and how you broke down your body. I'm going to give you a whole new life. Like as if you were being reborn. I'm going to give you a new heart. And I'm going to give you also a 24-7 personal trainer who will build you up daily. By the way, don't worry about your insurance or anything like that. It is free. It is on the house because of how I feel about you. Because of how I love you. All you need to do is show up. All you need to allow me to do is make those changes. All you need to allow me to do is allow that 24-7 personal trainer to work in your life. How many of you guys, if you got that opportunity, would take that deal knowing it was free? I'm sure a lot of you, right? You would take that deal. Even though you might not deserve it because you broke down that body, even though you might have struggled in life, you would take it because you know 
that it's, it's good news, man. It's good news to be able to have that. So to experience that abundant life, we do have to accept the gift of new life, renewed heart, and that personal helper, the Holy Spirit, that wants to invest in us continuously. Hear that word, continuously. He doesn't take a break. We do, but he doesn't. But we have to show up and trust him to see that the work he started in us will make it to completion, which we are promised. So I'm going to use it in an illustration, and I'm hoping it'll work here. Oh, there you are. Let's see. You might have seen this from uh, a pastor named Rashawn Copeland of Without Walls uh, Ministries, so credit goes to him. So I'm going to show you something here. This glass container is your life, my life. And these right here is the junk of our life. The envy, the malice, the hatred, you know, what else? All the junk, the addiction, the need for validation, the fear of failure, the need for love, the hurts, the anxiety, all of those things right here. And what happens is, before you know Jesus, this is what that life is like, and it, you, it's visible. People see it. People see those things. You could try to hide it, but you could still see the junk. And then eventually, you get that mountaintop experience, and you see the Spirit start to pour a little bit into your life. And at first, you're like, Okay, I'm, I'm not really noticing a lot of difference. But then as you continue to press forward and let them pour into your life a little bit more, you get strengthened by it. And you notice a little bit more. And you just continue to fill. And then eventually, he starts to pull this stuff out of your life. He just starts to pull it out in ways you can't even experience like that. And then all those things that were hurting you, that were bothering you, that were frustrating you, you're starting to feel it. But here's the problem. This. We see a little bit of that mountaintop experience. We see a little bit of that stuff starting to heal our lives. And when we're like, yeah. And then what happens? We plateau. We become complacent. We become, dare I say it, lukewarm. We start going through the motions, like I shared earlier. We hit that pit of despair in our lives. And we're like, there's no more, and I'm just going to go back to the way I was, or I'm just going to hide this. I'm going to try to hide this from people. I'm going to still go to church on Sundays. I'm going to try to hide this, though, because... But the truth is, it still comes out of your life. Maybe it's your anger. Maybe it's the way you treat people. Maybe it's the way things are happening. They still see it, even though you're, I'm a changed person. Here it is. And what ends up happening is, we get that way, and we feel that way, and we either get away from it and say, you know what, I give up. Or we have the opportunity to let him continue to pour over us richly. And when we allow him to do that, because that's a lot of times where we struggle, and that's what I needed, was to allow him to pour more. That meant a little bit more into my life. That meant maybe giving up certain things that I, that I, I, I was struggling with. Instead, trusting him that he's going to bring me through it. And then when we see that and we let him pour more over our lives, you start to see that eventually it just comes out so much that it starts to break through in great ways. Now, the powerful thing is now the difference is where those things of our life that were problems, they're no longer trapped in here. And when those fiery darts come back to try to get us, we have a lot more filling to take care of it. And we know and can trust and have confidence in God that it can't get us the way it has in the past until eventually it just starts to go. That's what we want to get to. We got to let him fill us up. We got to continue that Let me 
close with this. What does it look like to accept this deal? What does it really look like to accept that deal? How do we let him pour into our lives continuously? I'm going to give you four steps, and it's going to be this last slide here, Levi. For him to pour out richly into our lives, we truly have to seek him first all the time. When we start to change our ways to know that when things are happening in our life and he's the first place we go instead of, oh, well, I'll take care of this. Oh, I know what to do in this situation or whatnot. As we become more confident in knowing that he knows better for me than I know for me, then it's easier to start seeing to seek him out daily and to seek him out in all those things. And how do we seek him first? What does that actually look like? We read his word. We get into it because this is how he gets to us. We read his word. We pray without ceasing. I know that sounds strange. A lot of, we've shared it here before. It sounds like, what does that mean? We're stuck in a closet just praying away? No, it's, it's like meaning we're always in communication with our Father in heaven. We're always in communication, having one ear to the Lord and having one ear on the situation that's going on. Pray without ceasing. Second, we surround ourselves with kingdom-minded people. Because I'll tell you what, it's easy to say, yes, God has changed me, God has changed me. Thank you, I am free, free at last. I'll see you at the bar. Let's go pound a few down, because I'm having a horrible day. When it becomes something that's more than your relationship with God, then it's a problem. It's a problem. You need people in your life that are kingdom-minded, like you, that are going to continue to challenge you to grow and hold you accountable to that growing. You have to surrender, you know? first thing you have to do is surrender. The stuff that you, that you have that you want to keep control of and hold on to, when you release that, you feel a freedom right away. And it's hard, it's scary, but as you trust in him, that surrender will, will release and, and, and you'll start to recognize that he can do with you what you need to do, he needs to do. Lastly, one of the ways that I feel like we've been able to experience some of him pouring into our lives is serving his children especially the lost. You know, working with the youth now and having the testimony of my past that I shared with you, God has shown me how important it is to raise up a new generation of godly men. <laughs> I'm so thankful for his mercy back then when I wasn't one. And his grace and faithfulness to entrust me with that assignment because he works in crazy ways. He's showing me now how they felt, how they hurt, where that didn't even come into my mind before. It was about me and why my failings were happening was because of them. And I didn't know how I was hurting them. And now I hear and hear those same things happening in their lives. And I'm thinking to myself like, well, I'll tell you what, <laughs> you got to stay away from that. Believe me, I know, believe me, believe me. And then you can, you can see that, that tumble that they're going through. And it, it's now to the point where it's like, hey, you know, calling them. Don't, don't do that, don't do that. Stay away, you yeah. know. But I, it's amazing how God reveals the very things that were the very trouble in my life. He's made them now the things that he's using as testimony to, to share and speak into the lives of the youth here. We have to let him pour into our life. That's where we'll see the breakthroughs that we have to where it's overflowing and we get past those plateaus.
I want to pray with you guys today because I don't know who's in this audience today that might be experiencing that plateau. Or maybe, maybe it's that you're, you're on the mountaintop and you're concerned about heading back down. Or maybe it's that you are in this room today and you don't even know the good news of Jesus Christ. You just happen to be here. Maybe somebody invited you, something like that. And if that's you today, and you heard the verse where he says, by his goodness and loving kindness, he saved us. And that's something that you want today. We're going to have people praying for you up here. And I ask you to be bold and allow this to be the day where your life changes like it did mine when I finally surrendered that. So can I pray for us as we close here and then we will have uh, prayer leaders, the prayer team will be up here as well. Father, I just, uh, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share the testimony of my life with the people I love. I thank you for the person that you are changing and transforming each day as I continue to pursue you. I thank you, Lord, for the love and kindness that you've shown me. And Father, I pray for the people in this room, Lord, that if the testimony today that was shared by either myself or the youth, if that pierced the heart of one of the people in this room, Lord, that you would continue to show them that loving kindness right now. That they wouldn't leave through the threshold, the threshold of this uh, place, this, this sanctuary, without pressing in to what you want to invite them into. Father, I ask that you would give them boldness, that you would, that you would allow them to, to be strong enough to step forward and accept what you are wanting to pour into them. And Lord, we all want to see your kingdom as it is in heaven come to here on earth for our community, for our city, that we would see the transformation as we raise up a church of godly men and women who were a part of being Cretans at one point but are now your children, your heirs to eternal life, that they would speak that and see this community change in and through them. Father, I thank you so much again for the opportunity, and we just remain in awe of who you are. I pray these things in your son's mighty name. Amen.